Thanks, and sorry everyone about my uh, technical difficulties. I'm so sorry it didn't go more smoothly on my end, but very happy to connect with all of you in Santiago. So I am going to talk to you about leptomeningeal metastasis or LM as we call it. And um, I'll, I'll start with an overview and then move on to some details of the management. Next slide, please. Victor has taken the over again. Oh, is that me? Are you able to move it, Robert? Okay. So uh, the LM is defined as the metastatic dissemination of systemic cancer to the leptin and ninges, as well as to the cerebral spinal fluid in the subarachnoid space. And it is um, thought to be relatively uncommon, occurring in five to eight percent of patients with cancer. But when you consider the, the sheer number of patients with cancer, that five to eight percent can actually be quite significant. And most likely the incidence is underestimated. Some autopsy series show that up to 20 percent of patients with cancer um, have LM. Of the solid tumors, it's most commonly found in breast cancer and lung cancer, although as with parenchymal brain metastasis, it's melanoma that has the highest predilection to the leptomeninges. And the incidence is increasing. And part of that is that we have better methods of detection and we're more attuned to the idea that leptomeningeal metastasis may be the cause of a person's neurologic symptoms, but also we have better systemic cancer treatments. And with that, patients are surviving longer. And when patients live longer, they're more at risk of developing LM. Um, and, and to that note, some of the therapies, these large molecular therapies in particular, are thought to have difficulty crossing the blood-brain barrier and the blood CSF barrier. And thus, there's a sanctuary site for these tumor cells. Uh, classically, patients present with multifocal neurologic deficits, but these days, um, patients often come to our attention when they present with a new neurologic symptom, often early on, that doesn't have another explanation, and that triggers a workup for LM. The diagnosis is comprised of first having a high clinical suspicion, and the neuro exam is, is very important. We often find... Um, deficits, neurologic deficits, particularly cranial nerve deficits that a patient may not necessarily have appreciated prior to coming into the exam. An MRI of the neuro axis, um, brain and the spine is important, as well as CSF analysis to include cytology. Now, the CSF cytology is the gold standard for diagnosing LM, but because it's not the most sensitive test, if you do have these other features in place, the consistent MRI findings, um, uh, abnormal findings on the neuro exam in a patient with cancer, that can be enough to make the diagnosis. In terms of prognosis, the most important factors are the underlying primary tumor and also its subtype, for instance, triple negative breast cancer or EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer and the patient's functional status. Patients who are functioning better at diagnosis tend to do much better. Also the extent of the underlying systemic disease is very important as is any fixed neurologic deficits that the patient may have and whether there's treatment for the patient's underlying systemic disease. Survival without treatment is quite dismal at three to six weeks. With treatment, it's still quite poor, only three to six months. Although in reality, these days, depending on a patient's underlying tumor and their functional status, and considering that patients are being diagnosed earlier, we do see patients who are sometimes living a year or, or longer. So uh, there's no standard treatment for, for LM. And some of the strategies that are employed include whole brain radiation, focal radiation to a symptomatic spine lesion, intrathecal chemotherapy, and in some cases, very few, but increasing systemic therapy. Because uh, most of these modalities have a very modest impact in general, um, 
and because there's a low level of, of evidence for the use of these various modalities, practice patterns vary very widely um, across institutions and across the world. Because of the poor prognosis associated with LM, it's really important that palliative care and even hospice are, dis are discussed very early in the course and that um, the, this transition is, is always on the, on the table, so to speak, and that patients are, um, are, are aware of, of, of um, the different options and to include palliative care even when we're treating um, LM aggressively. And there's really only a few clinical trials available. Um, here's a, a snapshot of the trials that are around that are available um, around the world. And you see, at the time this was done, there was only 12 unique studies in LM available worldwide. And a lot of these are aimed at very focused groups. So this is an area as we're seeing patients who are um, functioning better at the time of the diagnosis that we can that we're really trying to work to improve upon. So um, when, when thinking about LM management, it's really important upfront to establish the patient's goals of care. What are their, what are their goals? What are their values? What are, they, what are they hoping for? What are they hoping to achieve with the management? Because really even what we consider aggressive treatment is, is, is palliative to some degree. The goals are to stabilize and protect the patient from further neurologic deterioration, to improve quality of life, and if possible, extend survival. And typically when we're talking about extending survival with the available therapies, we're talking in a matter of, uh, in terms of months. Um, a comprehensive and multidisciplinary approach is, is best for those who would be considered good risk for treatment. And that approach includes targeting the entire neuroaxis to so the brain and spine, both to dif the diffuse and disseminated disease and the more bulky nodules that can appear, as well as the systemic disease. If there's no therapy for the underlying systemic, systemic disease available, then it may not make much sense to treat the leptomeningeal metastasis. Many patients when they're diagnosed with LM um, have at the same time active or progressive systemic disease, but it's not always the case. Um, and supportive care. In terms of the, the good risk, the risk categories that I mentioned, the NCCN guidelines stratify a patient to guide the treatment into poor risk and good risk. And those so-called good risk patients are patients with a higher functional status, minimal or no neuro deficits, and good options for their extra CNS disease. In terms of um, next steps in the management consideration, so you've decided to go ahead and, and treat a patient with LM-directed therapy, what's next? Well, if they have symptomatic hydrocephalus, which a decent number of patients do, um, you have to think about how to treat that symptomatically. And that may be as, as simple as using steroids in some cases, other times the VP shunt should be considered in collaboration with the neurosurgeon and their thoughts of placing the shunt at that time. Then radiation therapy can be considered. If, if, the, if, the LMD is, if the LM is symptomatic or it's bulky, but it should be kept in mind that whole brain radiation has not been definitively associated with increased overall survival, but it can help with palliating the symptoms and getting to the bulky disease that um, the intrathecal chemo cannot approach. And, and also what needs to be considered is whether the patient has one of those underlying tumor subtypes, the EGFR lung cancer, ALK positive lung cancer, some of the breast cancer subtypes and melanoma that may have some response to systemic therapy. And then also to look for any possible clinical trials that may be available. And, and then finally, the consideration is for intrathecal chemotherapy. And the, one of the theories behind the intrathecal chemotherapy is that it minimizes the drug delivery barriers that are there for the systemic therapies. And also in these patients who are often heavily pretreated that you can circumvent the systemic side effects as it's given directly into the CSF compartment. Um, in terms of access, IT chemo can be delivered via a lumbar puncture, repeated lumbar punctures, or through um, an Omaya reservoir. 
at, at MD Anderson, we almost exclusively deliver the intrathecal chemotherapy through OMIA um, for ease of use, possibly decreased um, risk of infection, and possibly better um, dissemination throughout the, the CSF pathways. Um, again, before we start, after the OMIA is placed, we assess for CSF patency with a um, what we call indium study, a cisternogram. And if, if there is any block or slowing of flow, then of course there would be concern for some loculation of the intrathecal chemotherapy. Um, and, and it would not be able to penetrate the spaces and also the patient would be at higher risk of toxicity. If there is CSF block identified on that indium study, then the patients can be spot treated with radiation in, in coordination with the radiation oncologist. The most commonly used drugs across the world for intrathecal chemotherapy are methotrexate and cytarabine, also known as, as RSC. There is a, a couple of other drugs that were used. One has, um, isn't used very often anymore, and the other drug is no longer on the market. That was a longer acting form of, of cytarabine. But, um, there are very few studies, there's only about five randomized studies comparing the efficacy of, of these drugs. So again, there's very little data, there's a low level of, of evidence for the use of intrathecal chemo. And there's a lot of unknowns, including the um, optimal duration of, of therapy and the, um, the, 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 the dosing regimen in terms of timing. So in terms of complications, the most common complications of intrathecal chemotherapy that patients may experience is an acute aseptic or chemical meningitis, which when it happens typically occurs within a few hours of treatment. Um, some patients do develop a bacterial meningitis, but those numbers are um, in, in good hands, quite small, quite low. Um, in our series of about 130 patients, I believe there was three OMIA-associated infections, and those were treated with antibiotics and or removal of the OMIA reservoir. And then there are some uh, mechanical issues that can occur, leukoencephalopathy, particularly with methotrexate when it's used with uh, radiation and myelopathy. So at, at, at MD Anderson, um, our, our drug of choice is actually intrathecal topotecan, which is a topoisomerase inhibitor. And this, is, um, this drug is used based on a phase two study that was published, um, that was led by Dr. Groves here about, well, I guess in 2008, so about 13 years ago now. And um, the study found that um, intrathecal topotecan was well tolerated and that the efficacy was similar to the other intrathecal therapies um, from the historical data. So we went on to update this data retrospectively in the interval from when that study was published until 2018. And we also found that it was um, that that intrathecal topotecan was was very well tolerated, and the patients who were started on intrathecal topotecan had a median overall survival of six point five months, which was similar or better to the data that had been published for intrathecal therapies in the past. And what I think is um, worth noting is that we did find that patients who had a very good functional status, so a, fun a Karnofsky of 80 or higher, um, their, their um, survival was significantly better at 7.5 months compared to 3.8 months. And so all in all, this um, data supported our continued use of, of intrathecal topotecan. So in terms of some practical considerations in planning IT therapy, one is just determining those good candidates. When a patient is doing really well functionally or really poorly, I think those are the easier decisions. But when the patient is somewhere in the middle, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult um, and, and I think um, deserving of some good conversations with the patient about um, their, their hopes and their, their goals for the therapy. Quality of life is important. Um, the, the therapy requires that the patient come in twice a week and it's typically only given at, at big centers. So often um, there's travel considerations as well, um, which is not insignificant given the, the, 
sort of tender time in a patient's life. Um, also discussing realistic expectations and um, hospice, addressing hydrocephalus and bulky disease before starting intrathecal chemotherapy if that's warranted. And then of course, um, performing the flow study. We typically treat any chemical meningitis that, that develops with steroids. Um, that can be intrathecal, but typically we would just give oral steroids the day before and the day of therapy at a low dose. Um, we do continue or initiate systemic therapy. Uh, we find very little overlap in toxicity between the intrathecal therapies and the systemic therapies. So we haven't had any issues with giving concurrently. Um, we do check the CSF, um, I, I wrote periodically. Um, it might be once a week or twice a week. Um, because the sensitivity is low, it's, it's, it's maybe worth checking often enough that you can feel confident in the um, results that you're getting, the sample that you're getting. Um, we restage with a neurologic exam, repeat CSF or analysis of the CSF we've, we've obtained over the past two months, and repeat neuroaxis imaging every eight weeks to assess whether to continue therapy at the same dosing interval whether to maybe um, increase the interval between doses um, and whether or not to, to switch therapies or go to an, another modality. If the disease has progressed, we could switch to another agent, plan radiation with the radiation oncologist, consider a clinical trial or a transition um, to hospice. So I mentioned that there's some subtypes of uh, tumors that, that may have um, some benefit with, with systemic therapy. And I wanted to highlight a couple of systemic therapies as well as an intrathecal therapy that shows some promise. One is osimertinib, which is the third generation EGFR inhibitor. And um, this, this well-known study by, by Bloom did show a benefit when osimertinib was dosed at what, what's nicknamed the CNS dose, a double dose of the systemic dose that's used for these patients, um, did find a benefit for patients with LM with a median overall survival around 11 months. Um, in terms of checkpoint inhibitors, um, there's been a few small studies looking at checkpoint inhibitors, immunotherapy in LM. And also, even though the numbers have been small, it seems that overall the drugs have been well tolerated and, and do show some promise. And so that's being investigated further. And finally, I wanted to mention intrathecal trastuzumab. As you may know, um, systemic trastuzumab or Herceptin was game-changing for patients with systemic HER2 positive breast cancer, but wasn't shown to um, provide really any effective treatment for leptomeningeal metastasis. But in this study that was multi-center, the patients were given trastuzumab intrathecally and they tolerated it well. And the median, median overall survival was about 12 months, which is also um, much better, substantially better than the historical control. So we'll, um, when we have a patient with HER2 positive breast cancer, there are several systemic options that we may consider or, or, or treat concurrently with, but we'll often um, treat with IT, topotecan, and trastuzumab. Um, I also wanted to include this um, interesting early study, uh, sorry, of proton craniospinal radiation that was done at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So in theory, treating a patient with craniospinal irradiation makes sense because you're treating the entire neuroaxis and you can get all the disseminated disease. But the reality is that, that that's very toxic for these patients. But this idea of treating with protons, which which are um, less toxic to the, to the spinal cord in particular um, was very appealing. And this early study did show that there is, um, that it was well tolerated and, and some promise. And so uh, they're studying this in I believe in a phase two study. And we're also um, designing a study to look at this in combination with intrathecal topotecan. Response assessment has been a bit of a barrier um, to, 
<clears throat> comparing trials as, as the few trials that are out there in LM have used different measures of response. There's a RANO group, the RANO LM group that is working to standardize um, the response assessment using this composite that many neurologists will use, but in a, in a standardized way, looking at clinical evaluation, neuroaccess imaging and CSF cytology, keeping in mind that response and survival may be independent of cytologic improvement and sometimes imaging improvement. Sometimes patients deteriorate with negative cytology and the reverse can be true as well. So in terms of medical management, um, we, we really do need better therapies for these patients. And I think there's increasing interest over the years. There's um, people working on preclinical models, there's translational studies, liquid biopsy studies, and um, people working to, to to, towards rational drug development. And I think that this group here is, is really a key group to target these 20% of patients who develop LM after disease-free interval. So a lot of those patients are functioning really well and really willing and able to participate in a study. So um, I think I'm running short on time here. So I just wanted to point out a few of the ongoing and upcoming studies that we have here at MD Anderson. Um, from specific to HER2 positive disease, melanoma, and then more general for solid tumors. This is um, a, a schema for our two catnib study, which is a HER2 oral drug um, that has shown some benefit for patients with um, brain mets and is now FDA approved. And we're looking at it in um, LM. This is a study that's not for patients diagnosed with LM, but I think as was mentioned in previous talks is looking at pre versus post-op SRS for brain mets and the one-year LMD free rate. Here's another study that's opening up with a radio labeled monoclonal antibody, other studies around the country. And um, that, that's it. Just to summarize, LMD is really not that uncommon. The incidence is increasing. It is associated with a lot of morbidity and short survival, treatments limited, but with increased awareness and new advances, I hope that we'll have better options for the patient soon. Thank you.